So hello, come on in, come on in. We're about to start our uh, session of the afternoon. Our uh, session is entitled uh, Genomics and Genetics, and it is sponsored by the uh, Sanford Stem Cell Clinical Center here at uh, uh, UC San Diego Health, where the goal is to transform stem cell technology into actual therapeutics and uh, diagnostics for patients. So my name is Stefan Eichner. I'm a, a project scientist over at the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine in the EOLAB, and uh, I study uh, stem cell-based models of uh, genetic disorders in the area of neurodevelopmental and uh, neurodegenerative disease. So I received my PhD in, uh, at the University of Colorado. I'm an RNA biochemist, so this uh, session here for me to uh, chair today is a very, uh, uh, a very exciting one. Um, I then moved actually to the Salk Institute to do my postdoc uh, with Rusty Gage here, uh, studying, switching fields a little bit, uh, studying uh, 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 neurogenesis, adult and embryonic, uh, embryonic neurogenesis, um, and their post-transcriptional and transcriptional control. So I then took a three-year hiatus. I was at Roche in Basel, where I introduced genome editing technology uh, to the uh, to the pharma arena there, and. Um, now I'm back two years ago. It's hard to leave San Diego uh, once you've lived here for a while. And so I, I run in Genio's lab, uh, uh, I manage uh, one of uh, three large NIH-funded uh, centers for uh, autism-based uh, stem cell modeling. Um, so as a scientist who likes, as I say, uh, RNA biochemistry and uh, likes to take an RNA-centric view on things. I'm very excited to uh, chair this session here today. We have a very uh, fantastic lineup of three speakers, all respective leaders in their field. So first we'll hear from uh, Claude Aoshe, who will be presenting uh, highly innovative tools uh, to visualize the three-dimensional structure uh, of, of, the, uh, of the genome. Then Wendy Wang will tell us about the role of RNA helicases and long non-coding transcripts in regulating T helper cell immunity. And then last, not least, uh, Amy Pasquinelli. Amy, where are you? Will uh, tell us about uh, her latest uh, story, hot off the press, on surprising mechanisms of uh, uh, how microRNAs find their uh, target transcripts. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Claude O'Shea. Claude is an associate professor here at the SOC, uh, at the Molecular and Cell, or, sorry, Molecular and Cell Biology Laboratory. She was recently named uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute Faculty Scholar, which is awarded to early career scientists with the greatest potential to make unique contributions in their field. Clodagh studies adenovirus infection as a model for cancer research, a very uh, uh, unique angle, because she discovered that adenovirus uh, genetics and replication uh, machinery uh, hint at uh, processes in, in cancer cell proliferation. So today she'll talk about uh, a slightly different uh, aspect of her work. She'll be speaking on cracking the nucleus, visualizing the higher order 3D structure of DNA. Take it away. Thanks so much. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, yeah, it's, uh, so this has been a really exciting meeting. Um, and I think it's one of the most exciting times in science because we now know the sequence of, uh, of the genome and the, the, the question now, is really can we begin to use this really um, actually uh, uh, to impart functions, right? To correct functions and potentially to build whole new uh, uh, sort of biological devices. And that fundamentally is, is determined by our DNA. But it's not sort of just linear sequences of DNA. It's really how they're put together uh, as a genome uh, in the cell nucleus, which uniquely will determine actually uh, stoichiometrically expression patterns, effectively everything downstream uh, and everything that things does. The really interesting thing, though, is that uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the the structure of uh, uh, the uh, uh, of DNA and the fact that it was a double helix revealed how our genetic material is is copied and stored. However, base, uh, it's now clear that the linear sequence of DNA uh, does not necessarily determine its functions uh, in the genome, right? And in a way, this is what we have to cope with because, uh, in that sense, our DNA is not our destiny. And the reason is uh, structure determines function. But basically, if you stretched out uh, your genome, it would be two meters long, OK? And it has to fit into a nucleus, which is 0.1 micrometer cubed, OK? So it's immediately apparent that a level of compaction is required, right? 
a structural compaction that actually will determine the accessibility of these DNA sequences to being turned on and off to actually encoding gene programs that can confer youth, cancer, uh, and chronic disease. And so a critical question then is, what is the structure uh, of DNA uh, in the cell nucleus? And so, um, uh, remarkably, uh, uh, here's the textbook sort of uh, pictures uh, that we're all familiar with. Um, uh, uh, this is basically the uh, infamous sort of uh, beads in a string, which was based on in vitro reconstitution of nucleosomes uh, with DNA. Okay? And in general, you, you know, you'll see this depicted as transcriptionally active uh, DNA uh, in most uh, uh, reviews. However, uh, in order to achieve sort of the levels of compaction that are required uh, in the nucleus, it's thought that this undergoes higher order folding into a discrete uh, 30 nanometer uh, solenoid or, or zigzag structure. Um, and again, um, uh, this was based on uh, 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 in vitro reconstitution, certain salt concentrations where you can see this uh, occur uh, uh, in vitro. Then uh, it's thought to, again, uh, this fiber is thought to un uh, fold into these 120 nanometer uh, chromonemia. This is based on really seminal work from Andrew Belmont and others uh, in the 90s uh, on extracted nuclei, uh, where basically they extracted other components in order to be able to uh, uh, specifically see this. And then basically in the mitotic chromosome, it's a little bit of a black box still uh, because uh, the structure is so dense, we can't see, but it's thought to be a 700 nanometer structure. However, there's a reason it's a cartoon, okay? None of these structures have actually ever really been visualized in intact uh, cells. So recent cryo-EM uh, 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 data, uh, ESI, have suggested that actually it's not actually any of these structures at all, which also kind of underlie our individual pictures of what silent heterochromatin and things might look like. So a fundamental question then is, uh, you know, what is the structure of chromatin in the nucleus? And how does that determine and, and exquisitely tune uh, uh, all of the functions of the genome? Because that's of eminent importance, because that's the physiologically relevant structure that determines uh, 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 our functions. So to see uh, uh, DNA at that level, uh, you really need resolutions uh, that can only be achieved reliably by electron microscopy. Super resolution has made great strides. But light can tell you uh, spatial localization, much like a lighthouse marking a coast. But it doesn't actually reveal the underlying structure, right? That requires electron microscopy. But here's the problem. There is no sort of Herxt or DAPI uh, uh, that enables DNA to be visualized specifically by electron microscopy. And so here's um, uh, an osmium tetroxide stain cell. Osmium tetroxide stains actually cellular membranes. Um, uh, and um, uh, for some reason, this pointer is not working. OK. Um, but what you can see is uh, we, we know that DNA is inside in the nucleus, right? But you can't see it, right? It, it doesn't, we, we can't basically specifically pull out that structure. And the reason is basically, uh, 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 as I said, we don't have a way of specifically painting DNA to make it selectively electron dense so that we can reconstruct uh, both its local and global structure. And so uh, this reminded me, we got drawn into this basically because the same is true for actually engineering viral vectors, by the way, and actually understanding how they can be transcribed. Um, but uh, this reminded me, this sort of uh, a leap of faith that we have, which has been traditional electron microscopy, one of my favorite movies, which is uh, uh, the Indiana Jones movie. So this is the leap of faith, where he's basically apparently stepping into a void, right? Turns out there's actually an underlying structure there, but you couldn't see it because you can't pull it out, the contrast from, the, from everything else. But he has this neat trick, okay, where he basically takes a, a, a dust and he throws it over the surface to dust it specifically, okay? What if we could do the same thing for DNA, the nucleus, right? What if we could dust it so that we could visualize it for the first time in all its three-dimensional and structural glory, okay? And what's interesting is um, uh, uh, certain organic and inorganic fluorophores have a really unique uh, property, where in addition uh, to actually uh, emitting a photon uh, to go back to the ground state, some of them undergo a process which is called intersystem crossing, where an electron basically uh, is donated, it's unpaired. And in the cell, this actually gets donated uh, to triplet oxygen, making highly reactive oxygen species, which have a very, very limited diffusion uh, from their origin. Reactive oxygen species can be used to catalyze, basically, diaminobenzidine, which is soluble, into sort of this uh, a polymer, which can specifically bind to osmium, right? So the idea is, what if we could find a DNA dye 
that actually had this property, would it enable us then to dust the nucleosome and visualize it for the first time uh, in, in nucleus? So what we did, uh, this is Horan in my lab, is uh, we screened, basically, uh, uh, we set up a cell-based screen for DNA dyes that had a particular property. And the answer is we found one. Uh, it's really, it's a, basically a minor group binder that binds uh, specifically to DNA. Uh, it's, a, it's illuminated in the far red, so you can see it in the nucleus. It can also be used in live cells. But one thing that really happens is that in the presence of diaminobenzidine, you incubate it, and basically illuminate those cells uh, for uh, uh, five minutes, it actually will produce uh, uh, um, uh, reactive oxygen species locally that catalyze now, this is over a four minute period, uh, uh, the precipitation of DAB, like that dusting of the Indiana Jones, on the surface of DNA and chromatin uh, in the nucleus, okay? Now that DAB polymer has a, has a really high affinity uh, for osmium, which is uh, uh, what you saw before. So the question is then, was that enable us now to see uh, DNA uh, in the nucleus? So here's similar to what you saw before, and this is basically just the edge of our objective field, okay? So here's the osmium tetroxide stain cell. It binds membranes, binds the nuclear membrane, and here's the void. But now basically, specifically, in the part of the nucleus that was exposed uh, to that light, uh, you induce basically uh, that uh, polymer on the surface of DNA, which is then in, uh, binds to a metal cast of osmium, uh, enabling it uh, to be visualized. Okay, so that's cool. However, this is a thin section, right? And the problem is with thin sections, which is a 17 nanometer slice uh, through the cell, which is transmission electron microscopy, the DNA helix is 2.5 nanometers, for example. It's basically a 2D flat projection of everything in that volume, so you can't actually pick out uh, individual uh, 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 chromatin chains and strands, right? So that's where, this is all a collaboration with uh, my dear friend and collaborator, Mark Ellisman. Um, and so uh, what Mark has developed with Sebastian Fan and Rick Lawrence at UCSD is A-tilt EM tomography for in vivo samples, which basically allows us to take thick slices and now actually reconstruct uh, through the entire uh, 3D volume, which is basically one of the central problems in structural biology is the ability to cross scales, okay, from basically molecular to global, because both actually are integrating the nucleus to determine if DNA can be accessed and used. And so fundamentally, then, what you have, as I'll show you, is the ability now for the first time uh, to see uh, DNA uh, in the nucleus um, uh, at both basically at high resolutions, but as a continuum, because a single tomographic slice is one nanometer. That's the kind of volume you need in order to see a helix, okay? If you put eight slices together, serial slices together, you get basically three-dimensional volume now in Z of eight nanometers, right? That's perfect for potentially seeing a nucleosome, okay? But then basically, uh, as we work through the volume, and it's basically a three-dimensional movie as, as, as well, going from the top to the bottom, you can put together 16 nanometers, right? 84 nanometers, now you're into chromatin domains, right? And upwards, basically, into the entire organization. And so what it allows us to do is to see uh, chromatin as a continuum in the nucleus, at nucleosome resolutions, but megabase scales, okay? So what I'm gonna show you next is basically uh, sort of our first pictures of uh, the human genome um, uh, at those resolutions. And you're gonna be seeing about 98 megabases of DNA, all at the same resolution. We're gonna take a trip uh, through the nucleus, okay? And so now, basically, for the first time, uh, unlike uh, you know, the classic pictures, right? This isn't amorphous, this is highly defined. Uh, you can see the specificity of the stain. Here's the nuclear pore. You can't see the cage because it's not stained. But now inside here, this black structure is here, the little dots. That's basically uh, nucleosomes and chromatin uh, 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 in the nucleus, okay? And here's the silent heterochromatin up at the top. And so uh, in, in sections where basically there's not a lot of chromatin, the packing is low, uh, we can actually you know, see uh, volumes that are consistent with uh, individual uh, nucleosomes. This is primary uh, small airway epithelial cells and for DNA. But these, again, are flat structures. So, okay, does it undergo hierarchical folding? If the 30 nanometer structure is so prevalent, it should be immediately obvious, okay? However, we've been unable to see it. And for the most part, what we see is that chromatin is a polymer that actually has a variety of di diameters that are between five nanometers to 20 nanometers, okay? There's not a single one, which is important for reasons I'll come back to, okay? And that's kind of cool, but these are flat images, but basically, tomography allows us to reconstruct uh, volumes. And so here, 
you know, there's so many diverse structures, right? Because there's 60 PDB structures of uh, chromatin. But if you think about all the post-translational modifications and permutations of linker length, there are potentially 15 million different combinations that could occur in the nucleus, because that's what you might need to achieve regulation. So we see these wonderful sort of chain-like segments, a lot of loops, basically, uh, that twist and turn. And then we can take these and actually put the volume on them. This is segmentation. And using genetic algorithms, actually take uh, uh, the nucleosome structure and ask, you know, would these uh, potentially fit? And so sort of that's the brave new world of where we're going. So that's local uh, structure now, the ability to potentially begin to see uh, chromatin for the first time. But what's really cool and illuminating was this, okay? <laughs> so basically, what happens to a transcription factor when it comes into the nucleus? So here's this repressive heterochromatin domain, which everyone has said is 120 nanometers or not. It's not. The diameter is exactly the same. Okay, what you can see now actually is that uh, the chromatin it, it twists and turns the nucleus, but basically here at the nuclear membrane it contacts uh, the membrane, basically creating higher densities of itself within itself and the other. Now you can put a surface onto it, but imagine if you were a virus, a gene therapy vector, or a, a transcription factor coming into the nucleus. This has a huge consequence actually, because like a pinball machine, actually by breaking these contacts at the nuclear membrane, it actually may act like a pinball machine. Uh, directing you uh, into the nucleus. And that may be very important for understanding actually transcription factor search space, right? How does a transcription factor find its target in two minutes, right? Well, part of it might actually be by actually put, using as a barrier 40% of the DNA actually at the membrane, which actually has a contiguous sort of channels that could direct you actually to particular sites, right? Especially vectors as well, which is not a topic uh, I'll get into. So that's really changed uh, sort of my view uh, about potentially how it is. And also, it's why it's potentially not been detected, because it's, it makes it perfectly compatible with both activation and repression. But you need to be able to basically distinguish it at almost a four nanometer resolution, right? One shift, and you're in the repressive. Shift that way, and you potentially can be accessed. OK, that's interesting. Uh, what about mitotic chromosomes, right? I mean, how is epigenetic information maintained through division? And the thing that bothered me, again, reading these uh, textbooks, was I'm like going, well, hold on. If there are individual discrete structures, OK, then shouldn't all structure be broken down upon division? So how could you inherit anything, right? Um, and so the issue is, here's the iconic image. Um, but it's 50% protein, 50% DNA. And it's completely opaque. It's like a black hole, black box of the nucleus, because we've never been able to peer in to its structures because you can't pull out the DNA uh, from uh, the proteins without actually extracting it, at which point you destroy the structure you were trying to observe. If the stain is specific, could we do that for the first time and actually begin to visualize uh, actually what chromatin looks like uh, in uh, uh, its most condensed state, mitosis? And so here is basically um, a, a mitotic cell. And basically, the dye binds very specifically, you can see, uh, to the chromosomes. And also, you can oxidize it now to induce uh, the diamine or benzene. When you put it under the EM, now suddenly, yes, you can visualize uh, the mitotic chromosomes. So what's its structure? So here, it's three chromosomes, OK? This is actually the edges of a microtubule. And you can see a tracing is where we're going from the top to the bottom of the volume. So you're really visualizing the entire thing, OK? What you can see is actually all the chromatin is not higher order at all. In fact, it's all 5 to 24 nanometers. And it's arranged basically uh, um, sort of in these um, kind of arrays of, uh, of loops. But for the most part, it's just actually that there's, there's less space uh, that are between them. Okay. And so uh, what you can do then is ask, uh, well, what's its uh, size? And remarkably, it's all 5 to 20 nanometers. So that's really interesting, uh, because what it tells you then is that you don't have to change the primary structure of the chromatin. You merely change the space into which it's compacted, okay? which would explain the dynamics and also your ability to potentially inherit uh, epigenetic information through division. So instead, we think maybe there's a bandolino model, like a, an umbrella. right? Think of one of those fancy umbrellas where you press the button. It spans out, and you have attachment points which can collapse it back in. But you don't change the primary structure, because otherwise you'd lose uh, that structural information. So then instead of uh, the, sort of this hierarchical model, um, I think what's really exciting, uh, here's some of the structures that are in there, is actually, uh, it says that there's an amazing diversity of structures. And I think that's exciting, 
because they explain right, how genes are differently regulated. If there's only two or three, there should really only be the same flux. Right? How could you possibly have different structures? Right? So this is very interesting. But the problem then it raises, and I'll, I'll discuss this in the closing in three minutes. I'm now going to speculate is how can we reconcile that now with DNA accessibility, OK? This 30 nanometer, I mean, if everything's the same diameter, how can things be differentially accessible? And how can it be predictable? So one of the differences is here's chromatin mitotic and interphase. And what you can see is this, more, is this is more curvilinear. But here it bends back at much more angles, and it's flexible. And that's why, actually, any structure that has a single diameter, it'll only bend. It's called a persistence length at a specific length. But think of necklace with different beads. If you're at different diameters, actually you bend and flex at all length scales. And that's actually what allows you to compact. And that's why H1 uh, dissociation and dynamics is very important, actually. Uh, it can lead to repression and activation. So that's one part. But how can it be predictable? Right now, what do we do about gene regulation? Okay? There has to be order in chaos. Okay? So looking at this interface then in mitotic, I used to do a lot of climbing. This reminded me of limestone, and this reminded me of sort of granite. Never want to put a peg in this. And there's huge gaps in the interface cells, and it's here, but they're not geometric. They're fractal, actually. Uh, if it looks like a percolation cluster for any physicists. So maybe there's a similar structure that basically repeats across scales, where this is, can be read, but it just depends on uh, global factors, which actually enable robustness, whether it's accessed and used. And what's really interesting is these gaps, when we measure them, and they're relative, because there may be some shrinkage, you can kind of see that for small transcription factors, MIC, others, GFP, everything is accessible. It looks like water. But the fundamental definition of transcription is that RNA polymerase can get there. That's a structural absolute. It's that size. So where can it fit? The only places it can fit, actually, are potentially uh, in here, OK? So maybe actually then it's potentially the chromatin packing density, which could be modulated in many different ways, which actually determine uh, fundamentally whether there's actually space by which it can be accessed and used. So how can we begin to look at it? Is there a new way? How can we extract this then, if that's the case? And what's really interesting is mitotic is transcriptionally inactive, and you, you really can't fit that. Okay. So thinking about this then, what we've been able to do is going across scales. Imagine you wanted to come down and traverse the landscape from Mars. You'd have a map at different scales. This is Google Earth. Here's Yosemite, uh, my favorite climbing spot. And what you can describe this very complex data by is actually contour intervals, okay? which is basically height. Okay? So what about density intervals then? And this can predict wind trajectories and things like that. And this is what I'll leave you with, is when we did this, uh, uh, applying these sort of new algorithms we call it genomography, what becomes very interesting is now, basically, we, we sort of reduce it across uh, scales. But this is basically a chromatin volume per unit volume, a sphere mean volume, where we create densities. Here's like liquid you can easily pass through. That's where the beads and the string structures are. But up where heterochromatin is at the nuclear lamina, it has an interval of 45%. looks like a reef. That's exactly the same contour interval that exists in mitotic chromatin. Okay. So maybe it's basically a specific uh, packing density, then, that determines if things can be accessed and used. And that can be determined by different, many different mechanisms. If that's the case, what do embryonic stem cells look like, right? What do they look like? You predict they might look like a river valley, right? A beautiful pastoral elegaic landscape, which is completely open, right? So this is preliminary. Uh, but here you go. Here's chromatin in a, a H1 embryonic stem cells. What you can see again, the diameter is exactly the same. It's 5 to 20 nanometers. But if you look at the 3D map, uh, maybe it's just that actually everything is on the table. Everything can potentially be accessed. It's not clustered. And that could be fundamentally what it does. So that leaves with a model, which is basically that there could be a phase transition, actually at a particular occupancy density, which we call the CO value, uh, by which actually it, it teeters around, which enables robustness. And so up around here, um, you become topologically entangled, preventing access. And down here, you could be active and on the table. So with that, let me stop and thank uh, uh, the people who did the lab. Uh, Hornu was a uh, brilliant postdoc. Uh, who did this work. This was all done as well in collaboration with Mark Ellisman, Sebastian Fan, and Tom Derink at UCSD, and it was funded through the Keck and the NIH Director's Roadmap Initiative. All right. Thanks. Questions for Cloda? Oh. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like the uh, Chromatin is so densely packed, even, uh, even 
during a regular life cycle of the cell, do you, do you believe that the diffusion of transcription factors, accessing them, access yeah. there is, is diffusion limited? That's right. So, so this fits actually with some um, um, uh, very uh, beautiful work by um, uh, Ellenberg's lab, which was using fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. So GFP has a hydrodynamic radius of seven nanometers. But if you put five GFPs together, it becomes um, um, actually uh, diffusion limited. And so uh, what they showed is actually that, sure, GFP can go through the nucleus like anything, right? But actually, um, if you put five together, it can't. And it's sort of these irregular barriers which suggested anomalous diffusion, which from that you can derive again, almost what we've done structurally, um, a percolation cluster. So what's really interesting to think about, but this is a thought, is if you think then maybe we could, uh, maybe the nucleus is basically a discontinuous gel filtration column, okay? And so I'm very interested in P53, it's a tetramer, that's incredibly unusual for a transcription factor. But, you know, because for IPS, it means that everything has to be on. But it's interesting to think about helix loop helixes and things like that, they're actually quite compact. But certain transcription factors uh, uh, cannot do that. And so maybe there's actually like tube stations running through the nucleus different areas that can potentially be accessed and so that you can actually use it right like that. And so uh, everything can be on for us. Also, bear in mind the size of HDACs versus uh, HATs. About 200 kilodaltons difference, right, at least. And so, again, very interesting to think about how you would get heterochromatin spreading because you become trapped versus not, right? So it's basically disequilibrium. Uh, I have a question. Uh, look, here. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's very interesting to uh, can actually say the quantum. So in the ESL, uh, the quantum is very satellite, uh, so it's kind of pretty open quantum structure. So can you really distinguish uh, the quantum modification, you know, satellite quantum, desatellite, or more mesolite quantum through uh, 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 the, your, your technique? Yeah, so, um, so I think what's really interesting is the the primary structure, right, uh, you don't need to necessarily invoke better change. But histone modifications, um, they basically fundamentally regulate charge. And they actually uh, can regulate the exit angle of H1, which is what can determine bending, okay? And so potentially, actually, uh, with certain chromatin modifications, you can pack tighter because you're not charge repulsive. And you also change the bend angle, actually, through um, H1. So, th so that could be one way. What we're doing now is developing a second label. This is with Mark. We call this two-color EM. Um, where basically we have a, we're using second probes, and we've also got preliminary structures of ring 1B bodies using these new sort of uh, nanogold uh, probes. And again, in a polycomb body, structure is not different. It's just clustered in a way where actually it's the density. But what's kind of interesting about that is that, you know, fundamentally, this can't be that difficult. It, you know, it's really can't be that complex, okay? Because um, uh, there has to be one simple model. So what I think is interesting is, kind of like mountains, right? You can tell a mountain uh, that is formed by wind, uh, formed by glaciers, easily by its contour intervals, okay? And so actually, there could be one model, you have to achieve a certain density, but the dynamics by which it's held together and achieved could be through histone modifications, ring one meat bodies, lamin associated domains, but the goal is the end, in that actually you become topologically entangled at a certain concentration. Um, and how you do that determines actually how, how easily it can be untangled and accessed. That's the thought. Um, I love your talk. It was fantastic. Thank you. It was spectacular. Um, but as I was looking at your, I love the pinball model that you had. The one thing that struck me in your last few figures was, gee, as you said, the one way you can regulate which cells or which genes are going to be turned off is by the porosity exactly. of, your, of your nucleosome superstructure. But have you thought about how, I mean, certainly proteins themselves would worm their way in through. Yeah. They're going to be flexing right. and, and changing configuration too. How do you, how do you, oh, yeah. how no, do you I, think about that? No, that, that's absolutely dead on, right? <gasps> and so you're seeing a static structure, right? I think you might want to think about more like a kelp forest, okay? Um, where, again, you know, reprogramming tells us there's nothing that's fully off the table, right? But it just might be actually the barrier, which can be termed by concentration as well as a transcription factor, things like that. Uh, nuclear volume is going to be a critical effect because potentially then the same modifications depending on nuclear volume size could completely change actually how those modifications behave. And so Kristen Baldwin is a friend and colleague who we're collaborating with um, actually um, uh, who's been doing some amazing work. So we can actually do IPS and actually see if maybe, uh, and she's seen massive nuclear volume changes 
And so that actually may be the key. And I'd never thought about how different the nuclear size is, right? I mean, how we want to use it in cancer is uh, the pap smear has been the most diagnostic test. Forget all our genomics, right? That's been the most pivotal test for cancer. And basically, it's a simple stain that looks at nuclear uh, cytoplasmic ratios, actually, and crobinin. So if we can now look at it at these resolutions, actually, can we extract features using machine learning, which could be diagnostic and predictive, right? And could you change the volumes, actually, to enable epigenetic drugs regulation to, to work, right? What changes nuclear volume? Yeah, it's really interesting, I think. Yeah. factors people consider to be pioneer factors. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, maybe in, I, I don't know about their size, do you think maybe they have a small, smaller size so they can squeeze through those very condensed chromatin mm -hmm. um, environment? Yeah, so, so that's what's really um, interesting is, right, like what determines movement in the nucleus is a question we don't actually know, right? Um, and so um, um, uh, one of the things, though, is that uh, things that are floppy, I mean, again, think gel filtration, and disordered, right? As they become ordered, they can become actually more compact, right? Um, certainly, helix loop helix factors like MIC is actually very small, okay? Um, and so um, it could be, again, that these can be around. There's an avidity effect, then, as you open, that actually allows you to bring things in in kind of a, a recruitable phase, but that you do need pioneer factors, as you said, right? That create sort of the environment by which they could potentially be accessed now by other factors, and you drive forward, right? And that's what's interesting is that if things are existing at the edge of chaos, that's where the greatest regulation occurs because uh, it actually integrates many factors because it doesn't become stochastic anymore, right? Because you can basically pivot very quickly, has to be quick, has to be robust, but simple. And so that's kind of an idea. So one of the ways is you can begin to think about that synthetically now is in terms of um, actually um, um, PMLR alpha as a translocation uh, nucleus and again, PML is an oligomeric domain, and RER alpha, and so it can change. And so I think that's interesting. Um, and so uh, that's kind of what we're thinking. But tr Kristen has a beautiful system with her periodic table of transcription factors to explore that. And so uh, we're, we're looking at that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.